And here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Good afternoon. You are taking a live look right now at Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where SpaceX is ready to launch a Falcon 9 rocket for the company Utelsat on the 36D mission. This is the first of three SpaceX launches going on here just in one day alone across all of its different launch pads. We'll get more into that in just a moment. Right now, I see all the 5x5s in chat, meaning you can hear me. And for those who don't know, I am Sawyer Rosenstein. I will be your host for this particular launch. And joining me is Alex in the studio. Alex, how's it going? I'm doing fantastic. We have a rare customer launch, I guess, from, uh, from SpaceX, but... It's actually becoming less rare, I guess. Uh, I saw already a question talking about how common these are, so we'll probably talk about that as well today and what else this customer is doing. So, very exciting. Oh, yeah. And, of course, we have our amazing field team out there. Joining us on comms from the field is Mr. Max Evans. Max, how are you? I'm doing great, Sawyer. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good, My goodness. And welcome to a rather... It's a rather pretty afternoon here on Florida Space Coast. Yeah, uh, considering the last time you and I were hanging out, it was pouring rain for uh, Delta IV Heavy. This is a lot nicer weather-wise today. Oh, yeah. Dude, the, the, the big old elephant in the room right now is that big orange rocket over at 37. But we don't need to talk about that today. Yeah, it's back in its room with the MST rolled back. But anyway, SpaceX is the one today taking all the spotlight here with these launches. Now, we'll talk about all of the launches that they've got going on, but let's begin with this particular mission. So, Alex, do you mind giving us a quick overview of Utelsat 3060? Yeah, so the Utelsat 3060 is essentially a communication satellite for Utelsat that was built by Airbus uh, out there in Europe. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we have here some of the pictures of of the trip down to to Florida it was it was quite a trip I guess because uh, it was on on the Beluga uh, airplane but yeah uh, this this satellite will essentially be on the yeah there you go that's that's the Beluga from from Airbus um, it's a big airplane <laughs> to be <laughs> fair and and also it's it's a very very big satellite it's a five ton satellite um, essentially transmitting I think over one thousand TV channels quite crazy um it's going to be in the 36 degree 36 east degree uh position on the uh, a geostationary orbit so it's essentially going all the way to 36,000 uh kilometers up there and it is going to be over you know stationary over 36 degrees east over the earth there's there's that render of how it'll look like out there deployed probably a distance a little bit further away <laughs> though um but but yeah and so it'll you know, uh, in that position, it will be able to to give those communications, those TV, uh, th those TV satellite, um, uh, you, you know, that that TV satellite, those over one thousand channels that that it's going to be able to transmit over across, you know, Middle East, Af uh, South Africa, um, Europe, and everything. Like it's it's a very um, I, I don't know how to express this, but it's like it it, it covers a, a really great deal of. The Earth, and so, you know, it is. It is one of these that are built with electric uh, 
thrusters, so it's going to take a bit while to, to get there, but hopefully today Falcon 9 will be able to put it a little bit of higher orbit than usual. Uh, even though it's five tons, you know, Falcon 9 has been able to do a little bit more performance here and there, so hopefully it'll get some oomph out there to get to geostationary orbit. So yeah, today that satellite will be launched by Falcon 9. Falcon 9 will bring it to a transfer orbit. It will not put it all the way to geostationary orbit. Um, but it'll essentially be able to to get there m halfway there, so to speak, just like Bon Jovi, I guess. But uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, living on a prayer. I, yeah. I appreciate as someone who grew up in New Jersey, I appreciate that. Um, but obviously, we have a booster that's going to be getting it there. Max, do you mind filling us in a little bit about the booster today and the recovery plans? Absolutely. So on the docket today over at LC-39A is booster B-1076 about to embark, hopefully, on its 12th flight here in just under one hour. Um, it has, as, as mentioned before, it has flown uh, 11 previous times, starting out with CRS-26, OneWeb-16, Starlink-6-1, Intelsat-40E, Starlink-6-3, Starlink-6-6, 614, 621. O3B M Power 3 and 4, Obzon 3, and most recently Starlink 6 40. Uh, it will be heading downrange to the drone ship stationed uh, 648 kilometers downrange. Uh, just read the instructions. And the, the fairing recovery ship today will be Bob. So, again, every, every single uh, vessel right now currently in SpaceX's mini Navy at this point is a, is a complete veteran. So, we have no reason to suspect anything going wrong today. Um, just uh, another launch as usual for, uh, for SpaceX. There we go. And I mean, SpaceX has boosters going all over the place as we speak and going on right now today. Because, Alex, this is the first of three launches. We got three launches today from SpaceX, and there's boosters already being tested and everything. Yeah, we had a we had a tweet or X post uh, from SpaceX just a few, uh, I think, about an hour ago, talking precisely about how they had all of these rockets out there at the launch pads. Right now, we are tracking another two launches happening today: one from Florida and another one. So this is the current one, right there at LC thirty nine A. You're essentially look. Hang on, don't don't go that fast. The other one, there we go. Thanks, Jay. Uh, so that's the the same one that we're looking at the on the right screen. Right screen is live view. Left is the 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 picture from SpaceX on that tweet on that X post. And then we have other rockets as well. We have the one at Slick Forty, which will launch in about a few hours from now. I believe it is like three bit under three hours from now. From Slick Forty, we'll also be covering that one as well. That is the neighboring pad here at the Cape. And then from the other coast, from the West Coast, they're also preparing another launch a little bit later into the night. Out there, you can see B-1075. Um, no, excuse me. I think it is B-1051. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's B-1071-15. Uh, and if you can see here the comparison between all of the boosters, this one is actually the one that is less sooty for some reason. Um, even though it, it's got like 14 flights under its belt, um, somehow it is less sooty than the other two. The other two, like this one that, that is about to launch, as uh, Max was mentioning, this is going to be its 12th flight. So it has launched fewer times, and yet it's more sooty for some reason. And then uh, the other one is going to be its 18th flight uh, from Pad 40. So we're going to cover that that one from Pad 40. Fan number one will not be able to cover that, but you know, keep you know, stay tuned to all social media and everything as usual. Um, and the one thing that I will say, though, it's not the only few rockets, because they were saying the flight-proven Falcon 9 booster is vertical ahead of today's launches. Um, there, there are more things vertical that are essentially Falcon-related hardware. And I'm mostly sure if we can go to McGregor Live, there's another booster out there, vertical, ready to be tested. It is not flight-proven, though. To be fair to SpaceX, it is not flight-proven, but it'll, it'll be flight-proven really, really soon. That's Booster B1072, it is being um, essentially, you know, uh, undergoing another acceptance testing uh, round, and it'll be supporting Ghost U, that Falcon Heavy mission, uh, around June of this year. And then also, maybe if, if we even have that, there's, there's another flight-proven booster vertical at, uh, at the port, 
uh, which I'm really sure you can probably see uh, on some of the other, there you go, some of the other live streams as, you know, Space Coast Live. There you can see that should be B1078, I think it should be, on after its eighth launch last week or earlier this week. I, I even... Like my my sense of time is already slipping away because there's been so many launches lately. But yeah, there's a lot of hardware that SpaceX has around. You can also look at the SPL, Starbase Live, and everything. They have also Starship and everything. Yeah, you know the deal. Um, but you know, like there's so much activity going on. And again, as you were mentioning, Sawyer, we have three launches just today, right? And if they achieve that, it's gonna be complicated. But if they achieve that. They're gonna smash their record for fastest, uh, essentially, time between three launches consecutive, right? So I, I think right now it's about 20 hours and a little bit more minutes. I really haven't pulled up the, the exact number from me right now, so I cannot tell you exactly, but it's about that. And then uh, today, if everything launches on the time that it that it's supposed to launch, then it should be around three hours or, or four hours and 58 or 38 minutes or something like that. I don't remember. It's less than five hours. <laughs> I don't have the numbers in front of me. I can tell you later once I have them in front of me, but yeah. Well, if hopefully they smash that record and you smash that like button on the street. Uh, okay, that was, that was terrible. <laughs> I apologize for that. But yes, uh, I do want to thank, by the way, Jay, who is operating the stream today for bringing up all of those feeds and videos and pictures and stuff. So we also have Jay in the background. And I do want to mention we'll also be getting some feeds, hopefully, from D, who is out in the field along with Max. Speaking of which, we have a tweet from SpaceX saying that all systems are looking good and there are blue skies over pad 39A in Florida for today's Falcon 9 launch of the UTELSAT 36D mission. Max, you're out in the field there. How is the weather besides the blue sky part? Um, otherwise, I mean, it's, it's looking great. I mean, we have some mid and high, and high altitude clouds hanging around, but they honestly just add to, to the uh, scenery. It's very pretty out today. Uh, there is also a bit of a breeze coming out from the southeast at the moment, which is somewhat annoying. Uh, but nothing, nothing that would stand in the way of, of a uh, liftoff today. But honestly, it is a gorgeous day here in florida a very very gorgeous early spring day i want to say it's in the it's in the, either in the mid to high 70s right now and it feels glorious um we honestly had nothing to uh to complain about and we have a launch here uh, hopefully going up soon so it should look great love that and as you can see there on the left the official forecast from the 45th space wing weather squadron shows a 95 greater than 95 percent chance of a go for launch so less than five percent chance of violating any weather constraints that's about as good as it gets in terms of a launch forecast yeah they, they don't ever really put 100 so that's as close to 100 <laughs> as you're gonna get now let's yeah. see here i have a it very does look like good weather like you can see there oh yeah go, now, go I ahead. Have a very important question here uh, Michael Bertoldi asking, Stubby? Alex? Well, uh, for these missions that go to geosynchronous transfer orbit, they try to get the, the customer as much uh, delta V or oomph, as you will, right? Uh, to be able to not have to spend a lot of time getting to geostationary orbit, because that's the whole deal of, of the transfer orbit, to be able to you know, get as close as, but not completely there. Because uh, otherwise the, the the launcher will not be able to do that. It doesn't have the performance for that. You know, bring a Falcon Heavy to this pad, and it will be able to do that with a five-ton satellite. But you know, this is not a Falcon Heavy as much as we will like like it to be. But you know, uh, they cannot launch three Falcon Heavies in a row, I guess. <laughs> so Falcon Nine it is, and yeah, it it's most likely like. I'm 99.99999% sure that it is not going to be a stubby nozzle precisely for that. Because the stubby nozzle, while it saves a little bit of money and time in manufacturing, it does reduce the performance of the rocket. And so those are only used when the mission just essentially is easy in terms of performance for the rocket. So they don't need uh, to, you know, squeeze all of the, the performance out of it to be able to, you know, push to the limit the the the, the rocket. So yeah, that, that is essentially um 
how it is. By the way, I'm also pulling up like other stats. I know there's a couple of records that are just going to be like today, just with this mission launching, even though, you know, even if they don't do the other two launches, they will already be breaking records. I'll get to that later because I'm still, you know, pulling things <laughs> from my spreadsheets. Right. This isn't just your ordinary Starlink because it's not Starlink. <laughs> For those who know, I always like to try and find the fun facts on those Starlink missions, but this one, it's got plenty of them. And this kind of goes along with a question from Musical Wolves. Uh, Alex, the spreadsheet guy, I'll see if you've got this one. Uh, they're asking, on average, how many launches does SpaceX do for customers versus Starlinks? Yeah, so last year, for example, about two-thirds of the launches were Starlink. And you might think, wow, that's a lot, right? Um like they they barely do any customer launches and it is true that you know as a proportion of the total of launches they don't really do as many customer launches but if you actually do you know instead of the proportion you do the absolute number it is about 33 customer launches last year alone nobody else like no one else in the in the whole of the, you know, when you look at Rocket Lab, ULA, and whatnot, like, all of these other players, none of them have even come close to half of that in 2023, or even in any other year prior. Like, even ULA at one point, like, they had 16 launches or something like that. That is not even half of it, because, you know, half will be, like, 16 and a half or something. Uh, so it's about half of of those 33 customer launches that SpaceX was able to do in 2023. And in 2024, we're expecting about 50 launches for customers, which if you think about it, they're targeting almost 150, right? So 50 will be also a third of all the launches. So kind of matches, right? That, that sort of trend where, you know, no matter what, they're still increasing the amount of, of, of launches for customers, even though the overall uh, rate also increases. You know, the the that that is because they not only increase the starting uh, the cadence of starting launches, but also the customer launches. You know, get that increase in in cadence. So, man, <laughs> fifty launches uh, planned for for this year for customers is gonna be mind blowing. Yeah, that that's a crazy statistic <laughs> to think of there, and uh, I mean, this is already SpaceX's thirtieth mission of this year so far. So they are very much keeping busy. And uh, another good sign coming in that we are on track for liftoff is a release here from the Brevard Emergency Operations Center uh, saying they have activated their launch operations support team in preparation for this particular launch with the window opening at 552, which is the current plan T0, extending until 8 p.m. all times Eastern. So. That's where we're at in terms of activating extra help, but in terms of the actual countdown, let's take a look and see what we can expect here as we hit the T-minus 40-minute mark. At about T-minus 38 minutes, that's when the launch director will verify if the vehicle's go for propellant load, and if so, about three minutes later, they'll begin loading in the RP-1, or Rocket Propellant 1, which is a refined form of kerosene, uh, into stage one, along with the liquid oxygen, or loxygen as I like to call it. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, the second stage will begin loading only that RP-1. So that will all be happening, hopefully, about five minutes from now. Uh, and then we'll continue with the rest of the fueling of the vehicle, including the best vent, the second stage LOX load, preparing the engines for liftoff, topping off the tanks, and then Falcon 9 taking control of the countdown at T-minus one minute, hopefully with a liftoff 39 minutes and 30-ish seconds from now. Yeah, um, I just did, because uh, I was like, you, you said, oh, there's been 30 launches. Removing Starship out of that, that list of uh, number of, of launches, uh, in terms of Falcon 9 launches, for example, there's been 29 already. And about a third of that, you know, that trend that I mentioned before, uh, you know, coming back a bit to, to that to that thing of, you know, how many customer launches, they are still in that one third, two third kind of basis where they have done so far 10 customer launches in 19 Starlink missions. So that means 
uh, essentially one third for customers, two thirds for Starlink. And if this keeps going on all, 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 all year long, essentially, then we're going to get, you know, to that 50 and 100 uh, proportion, so to speak, 50 customer launches, 100 Starlink missions. We'll see if they get there, but it's quite amazing. Um, and I guess in that same note, I could go with one of my stats that I have here, which is this is going to be this is going to be the the 11th launch of a Falcon 9 this month, which will mean this will break the record for most number of Falcon 9 launches in a calendar in a calendar month. Total launches by SpaceX 12 because you know Starship, <laughs> but um, definitely really interesting that we still have another two in in the schedule, right? It, it could go all the way to 13 for um, certain people out there. That will be a lucky number, I guess. It is, in in you know, I'm, I'm quite indifferent to to it to be fair, but but yeah, uh, that is that is sort of the. The, the outlook for for March it's quite quite incredible. <laughs> Talking while muted. So you're yes, I am. Thank you. There we uh, go. I, I was trying to avoid mouth noises while drinking a sip of water here. Um, but yes, <laughs> I, I do want to thank some people here who've been giving some very generous support with uh, gifting memberships. Tom Dalton gifting five Red Team memberships. Jason Burgess also gifting five. And then you have Matt uh, Goslar, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, who first gifted 10 and then gifted another 10 for 20 gifted Red Team memberships. Coco, thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. Uh, and then Martin, thank you as well for gifting those Red Team memberships. And Marcus Burnett. Also, very much appreciate it. Uh, here's a question from Lalo. And Max, I'm going to put this one over to you. Uh, it says, in a Falcon 9 Starlink mission, what do the numbers mean, like Starlink 6-18, for example? So, for so example, this is start, this would be Starlink 6 launch 45. So, group 6 is the is the shell group that that uh, that that the that this group is going in, so they they're going to a, a selected targeted orbit, both altitude and um, words are, are just not coming to me are, are not coming to me coming to me today. Case in point, um, orbital inclination, and of course the number following that would be the number of launches they've had so far within this group. So with this being Starlink six six dash forty five, this is Starlink Group six shell six launch forty five, which. 45 alone like for this shell alone is is already is already incredible it feels like we've been we've been in group six forever uh but hopefully that was a, a simple enough explanation of what uh the naming nom nomenclatures are for Charlotte things yeah talking about muted sawyer yeah again <laughs> um the this this um these names are also usually very confusing because they launch off order like they were doing um 643 then 644 but then it so it was 641 643 then 644 but then back to 642 and then it went uh forward to 646 and now later today we're gonna have 645 then after that 647 so it's like it's it's such a chaos with these numbers all being you know thrown back and forth in terms of the of the order, but that's that's essentially how SpaceX does it. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And again, as you mentioned, we'll see that coming up in just a couple hours, uh, just down the the road, I guess, so to speak. There at Space Launch Complex Forty. But for now, in terms of how you tell Sat names it, I believe that is entirely up to the company itself and how they designate their satellites. So you can say that you tell Sat, anyways. You tell us the name. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Hey, look I at was that. trying that was... so hard, the pun. Hey, that was pretty good. It was not bad at all. Uh, let's see. We have Alex Vives saying, first of all, congratulations on 1 million subscribers. Thank you very much. Also, if this launch goes off on time and the Starlink launch goes off on time, Alex, would this be a record between launches on the best coast, I mean, East Coast. 
Um, hmm. I think the last one was two hours so it will like it was around two hours or so i don't have the numbers right in front of me because i have the overall turnaround times between launches but not you know not classified between you know one coast or the other i don't care which one you think is the best but that's another whole deal thing um i think yeah it was two hours 54 minutes i i, I actually just glanced at it and I have it right in front of me. Two hours, 54 minutes and 40 seconds between USSF 52 and Starlink Group 6-36. I know this one because it's like one of the, it, it's I think the second fastest turnaround time between two launches. And they, it's the fastest from a single um, coast, which is essentially the East Coast. So, you know, one, one of them was a Falcon Heavy from 39A and the other one was one from Sleek 40. I think this will not be the case, though. It will not break that record. By the way, uh, just looking here right now, I'm, I'm, you know, I have the the clock on my side, and I think we're approaching the moment that we should see some frost on the booster there. So that that will confirm that we are indeed into that propellant load. I mean, it's to be expected, right? Because SpaceX said that everything is looking good, so we we should hope that at least that frost will will come up in a few more seconds here. And it is visible. You can actually start to see the ring forming a little bit there towards the bottom. So that should be the good indication that fueling of the Falcon 9 is underway. Again, the first stage currently being loaded up with both the RP-1 and Loxygen. The second stage just getting loaded with RP-1 for now. (laughs) Uh, Here's a question from Musical Wolves. Max, uh, any of the three launches have potential for a jellyfish tonight? You know, I don't think so. I mean, the, the only one that would have would, would have been this one if it pushed all the way to the end of the window because the window for this goes to about 8 o'clock. And with sunset being around 7.40, 7.45 in that time frame, uh, that would have been an ideal time for a, um, a jellyfish. So uh, with this one launching in daytime and the next two missions launching at night, I don't, I don't believe so, unfortunately. But either way, they're still going to look marvelous, especially with, um, with flying in, the, in broad daylight for this one. Oh, yeah, it should still put on a really good show regardless. Uh, Here's a question, Alex. I'll put this one for you. KK is asking, how long does it take a drone ship turnaround after the booster lands on it? Because it seems like the port has been extremely busy. I mean, in a matter of 24 hours, they have taken, they took down an entire booster, got another drone ship out, had another booster come in, and you see that booster, they're still in port as well. I mean, how, how, how are they doing this so quickly, and how quick does it take? Yeah, it is an interesting question. I actually, um, first I, I tweeted about that, and then I got a reply from, from Kiko Donchev uh, from SpaceX about you know, how important it is to turn around these, these assets to improve the, the launch cadence, but also I wrote about this on, on TWIS on This Week in Space Flight. You gotta watch it, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and essentially, one of the things that, that we showed is that the time for a shortfall of Gravitas, which was the, the drone ship, it is not the drone ship that is gonna be used on this mission, it is gonna be the one for next mission, for the Starlink mission from Pad 40. Uh, but essentially, it it returned back from the landing site within 50 hours, which is incredible, and it essentially means that it it, it went at about seven knots on average. And at some points, we were looking at you know the the marine traffic data and everything, and it was going at some points at 11 knots. Like I was literally looking at it because I was like, are they gonna make it? Are they gonna reach the landing site with this? Because they need to come back drop the booster, and then go out again. So I was like, how are they going to do this rapid cadence with this? So I was following it, and at one point, I saw 11 knots, and I'm like, this is bonkers. They have this big, huge rocket vertical on it, you know, and they are booking it, going at 11 knots in the middle of the of the Atlantic, trying to get to the port, and they got there 50 hours after the landing, and it was really, really crazy. And I got that reply uh, from, from Kiko Lancho. He, he essentially was saying that um, you know, they, they need to turn around the, 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 the drone ships just as easily and as fast as they do the launch pads. And obviously, you know, they try to do that every every single time with care and, and you know, maintaining the safety of people because unlike the launch pads, 
when there's a launch on the launch pad, there's no one else there. But, you know, when obviously when there's a landing on the drone ship, there's no one there. But there are people that have to support the drone ship after, you know, the booster lands. And you, you need to tow back the, the drone ship and everything. So there's people involved on that. And, you know, you, you got to keep the safety of them. And pulling this off in 50 hours, it's mind-blowing. And while that is not the drone ship for this mission, the drone ship for this mission, just with the instructions, also completed... It was not a record turnaround, but it was quite a fast turnaround of, you know, coming back from, from the landing site, dropping off the booster, and then going out again to support this mission. It's quite amazing, folks. It's, like, mind-blowing how SpaceX can... Like, I still remember from the early days when it took one week for one of these drone ships to come back from, from its landing site. And the landing sites now are sometimes even further away than how they were back in the days. It's quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, this for this one, just read the instructions, is about 650 kilometers downrange. And to be able to do all that in, what, 50 hours to <laughs> turn everything around is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, we have an entire video on the channel about, uh, as we call it, SpaceX's Navy, the fleet, and how they mm. help with all of the turnaround. But it's just, yeah. it blows my mind. And sometimes... For example, when we put on the, you, you might you might see the people watching. You can see on the drone on the description that we put how far away the the drone ship is located. For this one, and maybe we can pull up the trajectory map if you know, since we're talking about the trajectory and the drone ship locations and everything. But the the drone ship is essentially uh, in a straight line to the east. There you can see it. So when you come back, you just gotta go back west. But when you come back from a from a drone ship landing for Starship. Uh, for a starship, for a Starlink, excuse me, there's so many stars. <laughs> um, for a Starlink, they go around the Bahamas. In the future, very shortly, they're going to have landings right in the middle. But so far, they have it around the Bahamas. And so what they do now is to avoid the, the some of the weather in, in the north of Bahamas. They just go around the islands. And so it means the trip is actually longer than the, you know, the straight distance from the launch pad to the landing site. So we put that that sort of landing distance from the launch pad to the landing location, but it actually takes longer because they, they sort of go around these these islands to be able to come back with the drone ship. So the trip is actually, I don't know, somewhere around seven, 700, um, 700 kilometers or something like that, which is even longer. So it's quite mind-blowing. It's seriously there. And that also then answers... The question of in which direction this flight will be going, it will be going <laughs> essentially due east on its way to geostationary transfer orbit. And along those lines, we actually did have a question here from Brain saying, will we ever see a landing pad in the Bahamas? Or do you think it'll just be all the drone ships? And I'm going to add the caveat of when. When do you think we'll finally start seeing the Bahamas landings? Yeah, the, the Bahamas landings... It was supposed to be uh, on tonight's mission. They've been sliding that off. Uh, at one point, it was scheduled for, for this weekend. Then it was supposed to be in the first week of April. And now it looks like it's going to be a little bit later into into the month. It seems like they are still, um, you know, prioritizing these Group 6 missions. Those landings out there in the middle of the Bahamas, that will be with Group 7 and Group 8 missions. The first one being Group 7-8. 28 and that'll be in the middle of the Bahamas but you know we have an app for that and you can definitely keep track of that we'll we'll be able to to put that out um you know as soon as we have a date for that mission we'll definitely be able to to put that onto the to the next space flight app and and you know you guys will be able to to see that but yeah there you can see the three upcoming launches I don't know if we can even go to the SpaceX tab, but there you'll see many, many launches are scheduled for April. One of them should be April TBD or something like that, and and it is going to be uh, six, uh, excuse me, seven twenty eight. Uh, scroll down and maybe you'll find it. There's so many. Look at look at that. There's there's so many launches, folks. <laughs> like look look at all that. <laughs> there's Galileo uh, satellites from ESA, some USSF mission from Vandenberg. There you can see Starlink Group 7-20. That'll be the first one that landing at uh, Bahamas. But that that mission, if you've been keeping track of the of the app at all, uh, it has been moved around a little bit here and there. So 
We'll see where it, where it actually launches. Uh, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of shuffling going on there. Yeah. It happens so often with the Starlings. They shuffle them so much. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like you can never really pick an exact date, but if you plan a trip to Florida and it's at least three days long, there's a pretty good chance you'll get a Starlink launch in there somewhere. Uh, Max, here's a question for you that might be a good teaser for something coming up next week. Rocket Man Andrew asking, what's going on with the Starship Tower at the Cape, which is just off to the side here at 39A? You know, that's a very interesting question, and that's one that is still pretty much unclear to, to just about everyone on the outside. Um, so from what we can observe from our cameras here at the press site, we have seen them uh, taking down all of the legs that that, are, that were at the base of, of the tower. I think that there's, there should be only one left. And those legs were, were supposed to be supporting a, a new orbital launch mount that, that was just recently rolled out of Hangar M at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Um, but the legs are being taken down, and we suspect, obviously, with, with only one more remaining, that one will be as well. Either they are going to be implementing a new system that we know roughly nothing about, or they are going, that is their way of, of clearing the area and redoing the foundation for the, the water-cooled steel plate that is currently on the first tower in Starbase. Um, this is all complete speculation, as we know, and we got a pretty good look at our flyover yesterday. Look out for a view next week, a video next week. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a very... Have... Go ahead, sorry. Lost Max there. But I can hear him. We did do a flyover of the Sawyer? Trinity Space Center Sawyer, and the Canaveral Space Force Station yesterday. So expect a KSE flyover video coming out this coming week. Leaks, I know, leaks. Uh, that is what the tower looks like so far. It looks like it might be the other way around. I think Sawyer cannot hear us. There we that go. Might be, okay, that might be. Now I the gotcha. Case. There okay. you go. Now, I don't know what happened there, but because we were trying to talk back to you, because we were able to hear Max, <laughs> but it was you that you were not able to to hear him. Uh, so yeah, I have but no you, idea what's you got going on with my technology correctly. today. I do apologize. It's, it's okay. You got the plug correctly. Did it? It wasn't even noticeable. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that is, we'll go with that. Uh, as we hit about 21 minutes now, you can see there again on the right, there is the Starship Tower as it is now. Like Max was saying, when I could hear him, the, the legs that were starting to come down of uh, where the OLM seems like it was going to be going. So it'll be very interesting to see what changes are made, and in particular, especially after what we've seen with certain parts over at Roberts Road. Ooh, teaser, it means you'll have to keep watching next week. So make sure you subscribe so you get that KSC flyover video when it comes out. It's also worth noting on that on that same topic that we saw what what may be parts for a a flame a water cooled flame diverter uh, over in Starbase, and that may be whatever design that may be going into may be eventually working its way over here as that or some evolution of that, and them clearing out the of the legs for for where the orbital launch mount would have gone that might be their way of of just preparing the site and, and and preparing to build around this new system so i guess we will have to stick around and see and speaking of clearing out clearing out the lines here with the t minus 20 minute vent right there it's uh with the calm weather there it's a little bit harder to see but there is the t minus 20 minute vent which we always call here the best vent. And Alex, as I mentioned, kind of involves clearing out some lines. So what exactly are we seeing with it? Yeah, not only that, but also preparing them for starting the liquid oxygen load on the second stage. So far, we have had liquid oxygen load on the first stage and RP1 load on both the stages. The RP1 load has already stopped on the second stage. The second stage already has all of its kerosene, and now they are preparing that liquid oxygen line to the second stage so that it's chilled down, all cleared, and ready to go to be able to, to fully load the the second stage with liquid oxygen. This is very similar. We're talking about the OLM and everything at Starbase and, you know, all the Starship hardware. We see a very similar event as well on the OLM at Starbase. We see that as well on the tower at, at Starbase. 
it is very similar. It's it's exactly pretty much the same kind of thing. They clear the lines, they chill them down, they prepare them, they condition them to be able to load liquid oxygen onto the vehicle. You know, uh, the only difference with with a Starship, obviously, is that the fuel there it is not uh, RP1 kerosene; it is methane. But other than that, the oxidizer is the same. It's liquid oxygen altogether. <laughs> There we go. And again, I love getting that close-up shot as well from D and Max out there operating their cameras as well. Seeing that vent, and that should stop at T minus 16 minutes. And as it does, that will be a good indication that the liquid oxygen load on the second stage is underway. I do want to take a moment here to uh, thank some people, including Kevin, who's also in the back there, getting some of those nice tight zoom shots. Um, <laughs> uh, Liui, I really hope I'm saying that right. Thanks for becoming a Pad Rat member. Jim Graves, thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. Brian, thank you for gifting a Red Team membership. RC Horseman, thank you for gifting five. And Christopher Luis, thank you for gifting 50 Red Team memberships. Wow. Holy cow. Oh, no, wait, that's McGregor with the cows. Holy cape. Thank you so much for the generous support and for giving the opportunity for people who might not get it to see some of the amazing behind the scenes stuff that goes on here at NSF, both down at Starbase and just in time to catch some of the uh, flyover pictures before they go out in the video as well. So lots of opportunities there that were given by Christopher. So thank you very, very much for that. Let's take some more of your questions. Remind you, you can tag us at NASA Spaceflight, and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Now, here's an interesting question, Alex. <laughs> Chris Helgren is asking, is there ever going to be an end date to Starlink launches? <laughs> uh, aren't we all asking that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really find it difficult to see unless, you know, for for whatever reason, SpaceX just altogether stops uh, launching Starlink and decides to, you know, not not continue Starlink or whatever. I, I just don't see it because even, even when you think about, you know, once the constellation is complete, the older satellites will need to be replaced. And so you still need to, to launch Starlink satellites. And then very, very far into the future, you can imagine them launching Starlinks to the moon, Starlinks to Mars, to other places, whatever, right? Um, so I don't know. I guess there's going to be an end, obviously, but it's just very far into the future to even, you know, put a date on it. It's not going to be, I don't know, like 26th of September of 2048 or something. Like, we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> And no, I maybe, guess maybe I end up lucky and, and it's that date, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna hold you to it. And then uh Human with the question here, kinda of going along with the continuous Starlink launches of when will we finally get uh, RTLS Starlink? Um, you know, that is an interesting question because we really haven't we we really haven't had any more pivot work again about RTLS Starlinks. In theory, they could, because um, you know that that paperwork is communications paperwork that they have with the Federal Commission, uh, Federal Communications Commission, and they have another general communications permit to, in general, to uh, you know talk back to the rocket and everything for any sort of mission. Uh, I don't even know why they're still you know doing these sort of permits per mission. I welcome them, though, because that means we get to know what kind of missions we, we're expecting in the future. So <laughs> SpaceX, keep doing that, please. And But, but you know, in theory, they could do that. Uh, they could use that general purpose communications permit that essentially is even for CRS missions and everything. Like It's just for a, a, a huge amount of, of different types of missions and at least different locations for landings and everything, including RTLS for stalling missions. So I I don't I don't really know to be fair when we're gonna see that. It we haven't seen dedicated FCC permits for missions saying RTLS in in a while, but in theory they could, you know, pull up something out of their bags and and try it out just for funds. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, because why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> also love seeing the birds all flying around there. Reminder that this is a launch site in the middle of a wildlife reserve here. So with the, uh, it's just it, science and nature. I love it. And uh, I know a couple of people in the back channel that really love the birds around here. So speaking nice of birds, yeah. Uh -huh. Speaking of the shot, we also can see other things. You can see already some of that condensation appearing on the second stage. You can see some vapors. It's it's very distant, obviously. Uh, we don't have the pleasure of having pad cameras as SpaceX does. SpaceX cheats. They can do that. <laughs> uh, we can't. Uh, but you can see some of that condensation already appearing on the second stage liquid oxygen tank, which means you know that everything is progressing accordingly. That's what we want to hear as we hit T minus 13 minutes until scheduled liftoff. Now, of course, that's the clean part of the booster. It's been a little harder to see the frost because, A, it's not that humid out there today, and, B, this is a really sooty booster for a 12th flight. Uh, Max, I'll throw this one to you. Dot asking, how come they don't just hose down the boosters as a regular part of their refurb for the next launch? Why leave the soot? Well, a part of the reason, well, I guess for... A, most most of the reason why they leave the soot is what one it takes man hours to to clean off the booster, thus thus adding more cost needed to refurb the boosters. But also the weight that the the carbon soot adds to the booster is insignificant compared to the performance that the nine Merlins can dish out. And honestly, it's just unless they they really need to get down to either the welds or or potentially where a crack or a deform or 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 the Somewhere on the tanks being deformed, or some kind of anomalous, uh, the anomalous appearance of something happening. They don't. There's no real reason to get rid of it because it, it's it, it's it's more labor than than it's worth to uh, get rid of it. Essentially, exactly. And I know even SpaceX basically said that uh, with the one they have out at Hawthorne, they were mad at themselves for deciding to clean it and paint it and all of that. And because it, it's kind of like a a battle scar of, you know, here we are 12 flights in, still going, made it through all the re-entries, everything like that. And it's, it's just, a, it, it's a very labor-intensive process, and even the, the, the three boosters that are sitting at 19 flights, the weight of that soot on the booster is relatively insignificant, so it, it's more hassle than it's, it's really worth, to be honest. Exactly. And especially as they continue to recover so many more of these, because Alex, this landing attempt will be a milestone right yeah boy it's it, it's quite crazy to think about it this is going to be the 300th landing attempt you know i said at the beginning i have stats i'm sort of you know peppering them here on the stream <laughs> and trying to you know <laughs> not dump them all at once uh but yeah that's one of the stats for today as well this is going to be the 300th landing attempt for a booster only 11 of them have failed so far. And so what that means is that this will eventually be the 289th um, su successful landing. Obviously, we're hoping that it is going to be a successful landing. Uh, and we, we think it's going to be that. And if it does become a successful landing, it will not only be the 289th total, but also the 215th consecutive since the last landing failure. It is quite like just saying this these numbers this this stop meaning anything if you think about it because it's <laughs> like after 100 what else can you say right it's already such a mind-blowing amount of of attempts and lendings and and everything and today if you've seen you know your calendars it's march 30th which means today is flight proven day <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a special uh holiday i guess for for uh, space enthusiasts, but yeah, today marks seventh anniversary since the SES-10 mission, which was the first time SpaceX reflew a Falcon 9 booster. Which I guess it, it's kind of you know fitting, you know, that the 300th landing attempt it is also the seventh year anniversary of that reflight. You can see there some of those shots of the launch from Vancouver uh, for SpaceX, and those are really great shots, by the way. Um, and yeah, man, it it's now so easy to say, oh, it's the 10th launch, it's the 15th launch of this booster and whatever. 
just saying all of these numbers, it's starting to, to lose its meaning because it's already way beyond what, what I can even try to fit in my brain. Oh, it's so weird seeing the Falcon 9 full thrust version as opposed to the Block 5 that we see now, which, Max, I know you need to go and capture the Block 5 that's about to lift off in about eight and a half minutes. So we will let you go to your cameras and we will talk to you after launch. Hey, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll see you all on the other side. Happy shooting. All right. We are now about eight minutes away. Just a quick recap here for those who are just joining. This is Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, where this Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch the UTELSAT 36D mission to geostationary transfer orbit. This satellite will help provide uh, TV as well as government services uh, all across the 36 degree east mark, which includes Africa, Russia, Europe. So it'll hopefully be providing TV to some people, uh, services to the governments, and will lift off about seven and a half minutes from now. Uh, this, if you're wondering, also is booster 1076 on its 12th flight, uh, which is scheduled to land downrange on Just Read the Instructions. Before that, of course, we have to uh, finish getting the rocket ready for launch, and that includes chilling down the engines, which should be beginning any second. Right, Alex? Indeed. So that'll be at the T-7 minute mark, and that'll be pretty much like what we saw with the, with the with the Stromback event, the T minus 20 minute event, and what I've explained about, you know, chilling down and conditioning it and purging it and everything. Same kind of process has to go on with, uh, with the engines because the engines are also going to be, you know, having a lot of uh, liquid oxygen flowing through them, uh, very high flows. And so, you know, that, that metal, that, that, that material needs to be conditioned ahead of, of that of that ignition, of that, you know, going at full flow, at full uh, pressures and everything. So pretty much that's, that's the whole deal with the engine chill. By the way, I've just heard them uh, calling out engine chill, so we're essentially in that process. Also around this time, we should have uh, the booster kerosene load complete, which will mean that all of the kerosene has already been loaded on, onto the rocket. No more kerosene is needed for this flight, but the liquid oxygen load is still continuing. That'll be wrapping up at around T minus three minutes on the booster and around T minus two minutes for the second stage. But a little bit earlier than that, we're going to we're gonna see that strong back retracting, hopefully, because at one point, I believe there, there was a, a, a mission recently where the strong back did not retract. And so we were kind of like, what? What is happening here? <laughs> oh, don't remind us. No, we don't want that again. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I do want to thank some support here as we get into close to the final five minutes of the count here. Uh, Kenneth, thank you very much for the support. Saying when uh, DSLFF duels simultaneous launch from Florida. I mean, ah, uh, <laughs> that's the Armageddon uh, kind of kind of stunt, right? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> when you launch two rockets side by side. Oh gosh, I, I, oh. I'm not. I can make so many references. I'm not even going to. But <laughs> hey, a couple hours is pretty good, at least. I'll take that for today. Because again, those uh, unaware, there are still two more Falcon Nine launches scheduled today. After this one, one from you know, just down the road at Slick Forty, and then another one over in Vandenberg in California. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a movie reference here. We're going to need a bigger rocket. <laughs> 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 We're going to need the Starship probably for, for that kind of uh, rapid cadence where you're essentially launching two of them at once. It's not that SpaceX cannot do that with Falcon 9. They have redundant teams and hardware and everything. Uh, and essentially the launch pads are completely isolated between each other in terms of their operations. But I... Just don't see the need for Falcon 9 to really um, have to fly that, you know, w with that kind of how you have two lo uh, two launches happening at the same time. I just don't see that with Falcon 9. Starship in the future, though, there might be a chance that will happen. So we we're going to need a bigger rocket. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, we should be getting that strong back retract. Again, where those little clamp arms 
move away from underneath that fairing, it leans back a whopping 1.8 degrees just to get it a little bit out of the way ahead of liftoff. And then, of course, once we hit T0, it will throw back all of the way. There we go. Now they're opening up. Got a little worried there for a second. Uh, yeah, and we often are, are asked, why is it that, that this is done? And if you think about it, when they retract just a bit, instead of retracting all the way uh, for launch like they do at Vandenberg, that means that the that the umbilical lines don't need to be as long, because the, the strongback with the lines are only retracted a little bit. Because when you do the throwback at launch, they just throw back and disconnect from the rocket. Whereas at Vandenberg, when they when they retract the whole the whole strong back, they don't retract the, the umbilicals. So the umbilicals need to be that long in order to be able to, you know, reach the rocket, as you will, right? And so otherwise they cannot reach the rocket. And and if you think about it, the shorter the lines, the less refurbishment that you need, and so it's easier. Exactly. And you could even kind of see it a bit when that retract was going of just how little connections there were but keep in mind that strong back is what provides not just fueling into the vehicle but also works for data communication back to the launch control center uh it involves conditioning for inside the payload fairing if certain satellites require specific you know air conditioning or pressure requirements so all of that comes from the uh strong back there you know what doesn't come from the strong back what the liquid oxygen into the into the first stage, but which is loaded from the launch mount, and you know what? It is not loading right now because it's already complete. Yeah. <laughs> the liquid oxygen load on the first stage is complete, so that means that launch pad doesn't need to do any more work other than releasing the rocket, hopefully in two minutes from now. But the liquid oxygen load on the second stage is going to wrap up in just a few more seconds here. And when that happens, we're going to see that T-20 minute event instead of T-20 minute event, it'll be the T-1 minute and whatever seconds uh, event, which will be uh, coming off. There you see, uh, that is a confirmation that a stage two LOX load is complete and the Falcon 9 is just fully loaded for flight. Also, you can see the tower, uh, the, the water tower also... Uh, Spewing water. Uh, that is expected. It is not a, a, a leak or anything, but yeah. <laughs> right, and that is, uh, I believe, purging the lines there of any remaining liquid oxygen because gaseous slash liquid oxygen with flames going right by it could potentially cause fireballs that we don't want. And yes, the uh, water tower does overflow intentionally. Uh, those They will flow the water in there using the rainbirds just prior to engine ignition. Now, yeah, minus... that is completely normal, folks. And at T-minus one minute now, we should have the tanks pressurizing to flight levels inside of the vehicle, as well as Falcon 9 entering startup. That is when the onboard computers will take control of the majority of the count here, and so if they see anything wrong, it can stop its own countdown. But we're hoping not for that. We're hoping for a launch in a little over 30 seconds from now. And we are go for launch. All right, that's confirmation from the launch director. We are go for launch in about 30 seconds from now. This booster going on its 12th flight, going for the 11th SpaceX launch, if you include Starship, uh, or the 11th Falcon 9 launch, excuse me, this year. Coming up on about 10 seconds. We'll keep an eye on the bottom of the rocket for that flash. Ignition and liftoff. Utelsat 36D on its way to geostationary transfer orbit. Go Falcon 9, go.
vapor cone there as it passes through the speed of sound. That's what that ring was as we now approach max Q, maximum aerodynamic pressure pushing down on Falcon 9. Is this max Q from max E? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the, the sound on that one was absolutely beautiful. As it continues pitching down range, 90 seconds into flight here. You can see that plume expanding as the atmosphere gets thinner. You can really see all of the nine Merlin 1D engines. Which only have about 45 seconds left powering on this first stage here of flight before we get to... A couple of events in quick succession, right, Alex? Yeah, we'll have Miko. Those nine engines will shut down in pairs alongside with the center engine as well. And then four pushers will push away the second stage, uh, clearing the stage separation portion of the flight. And then the MVAC engine will ignite. So keep an eye on that, and hopefully it all goes well as usual. <laughs> there we go, continuing to track it from the ground here. Uh, we should be coming up on Nico in just a few seconds. And let's see if we can see it from the ground here. There it is. There's main engine cutoff. We will have stage separation. And we should see the second stage firing its engines and continuing on its way to geostationary transfer orbit. So far, everything looks good. There we go, you can see it better now from the track there. It has ignited the single Merlin vacuum engine, powering this uh, UTELSAT 36D satellite towards geostationary transfer orbit. That stage will still burn for another Five, approximately five minutes. Yeah, Come meanwhile on. the fairing... Oh, sorry, I just stole your bit. You take it, no, <laughs> go for it. The fairing is going to be separating, exposing the, the satellite Eutelsat 360 to, to the vacuum of a space. It's technically already in vacuum because they have vents and everything, but, you know, it'll expose it completely to space. And there you can see... There's the separation, separation on SpaceX's feed. And for a moment there from our cameras, you could see three dots. Those two yeah. additional dots were the fairings after they've fallen away from the vehicle. That's still amazing to be able to capture that from the ground. And part of the fact is that those actually do have some thrusters on them as well that help kind of maneuver them down because those are all recovered and flown again. Yeah, meanwhile, the first stage is right now passing through its apogee point, some somewhat parabolic trajectory down to the drone ship. Um, it usually happens always at 420 for some reason. I, I wonder if that's on purpose. But <laughs> anyways, uh, uh, right now it is using its cold gas thrusters to be able to maneuver to an engine's first position and prepare for that entry burn, which I'm really sure you want to talk about because you have your own bits as well for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still have a couple of minutes until that. Okay, so. I'll, give, I'll give you that time then to do your, <laughs> your thing. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, great look there at the second stage, and oh, just the view of Earth below it is spectacular. Yeah. It's a really great time of day because, like, the sun is low enough that as the second stage continues to go into orbit, it just drops and drops and drops. And at one point, we're probably going to see that that overall sunset. It's going to be amazing. And that, hopefully, we'll see it. No, <laughs> that second stage view from 150 kilometers above the Earth. Yep. It is currently putting the, the satellite into what is called a parking orbit. Um, essentially, it's going to be a low Earth orbit parking orbit, and then it'll re relight again in about 30 minutes from now, or 20 minutes from now, excuse me, to be able to push the satellite into jet, that geostationary transfer orbit um, to, you know, for, for the satellite to do all, all of its stuff out there in geostationary orbit. And meanwhile, you see in the bottom left there, the first stage now below 100 kilometers, the speed starting to pick up. There is another burn that will help slow it down, and that should be coming up in the next 30 seconds or so. 
and that is the first stage entry burn. So right now you can see the cold gas jet thrusters kind of helping to maneuver it into its position. And then it will light up some of the Merlin engines and it will basically fight fire with fire to help slow itself down here. So we should see that ignition coming up any moment. Keep an eye on the left side of your screen. And there we go. There is the entry burn. Literally creating a sort of cone around the first stage itself, which is protecting it from the heat of the atmosphere. This is also where you tend to see a lot of the soot on the booster, because what it's flying through is part of that RP-1, which is kerosene, which is carbon-based. So that leaves the soot on the booster there. And shut down. That looked pretty good to me. Now watch for the steering on those. First the cold gas thrusters, and now the, the, the grid fins are going to be trying to steer the, the booster down to the drone ship. It's, it's always amazing how they do this. And oh, it's yeah. a 300th attempt. Yeah, <laughs> this is the 300th landing attempt for SpaceX here. So super significant, which we should see uh, Seco 1 coming up in about 40 seconds from now. That'll be the shutdown of the Merlin vacuum engine. And that should be followed very shortly thereafter by the landing burn beginning for that first stage. Uh, hopefully touching down a short while later on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. Let's see. So on the right side there, just a little bit longer left in that first burn. There is a second burn that will happen. That's why this is uh, Seco 1, second engine cutoff 1. So there will be a Seco 2. And on the left side up. now... On the Lennon burn. <laughs> yep. Uh, under four kilometers now. Under a thousand kilometers an hour for that first stage. We should be seeing shutdown of the Merlin vacuum here any moment. Both there it goes. Yeah. And the landing burn. See the drone ship super clear there. Gridfin steering. And landing leg deploy. Touchdown. Wow, SpaceX's 300th landing attempt. Another success in the books. Unbelievable. 289th. There's only been 11 failed landings. It, it's kind of crazy. It felt like it was more, but there's only 11 landing failures. This one, you know, adds up. So in 11 landings, which all of them are going to be going successfully, obviously. We're going to have uh, that that 300th successful landing attempt. It's going to be amazing. Coming soon to a drone ship near you. And then, of course, you can see the empty pad at Launch Complex 39A. That now leaves one Falcon 9 on the launch pad in Florida. Yeah. Meanwhile, the second stage is doing its own thing, coasting in space, and in about 15, 20 minutes from now, it's going to relight again. You can see some of those uh, ion thrusters that I was talking about uh, for that satellite. It's going to take a, a few months to get there to geostationary orbit, but it's more efficient than using hypergolics. Also, uh, more healthy, I guess, for people handling the satellite. Um, but watch out as well, because usually we see this thing that after the launch, the strong bag goes up on the launch site. So that's why we're also keeping that empty launch pad view as well, because this pad is going to be turned around for another launch in about a week from now. Um, and speaking of turnarounds, I guess I should say there's another stat. I didn't want to mention this before the launch because I, <laughs> I didn't want to jinx it. But essentially, this is now the fastest turnaround time for this launch pad. So launch complex 39A getting into into the under one week turnaround uh, sort of uh, time frame there. As you know, the other two pads are already there. This pad got a little bit of, of a delay in, in getting to that point, but essentially we are now into into that. It's broken already its previous turnaround record. Kind of crazy. <laughs> it's very crazy. 
especially considering, you know, maintenance on the launch pad themselves and the fact that right now 39A supports so many different variants here. You've got the Falcon 9 for crew and cargo with Dragon. You've got regular Falcon 9. You had one Falcon 9 mission that ended up loading methane into the spacecraft through the payload fairing. You also have Falcon Heavy. All of that available from 39A and yet still getting this quick turnaround. I love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, while that launch was going on, we did get some support that I want to acknowledge. And keep in mind, we have replays coming up of this. So we will be able to show you some more fantastic views of that launch while we wait for the second engine start 2, which will be the last burn before it releases the satellite into its planned parking orbit. Uh, Deborah saying, favorite stat? One million subs on the Delta Scrub. <laughs> uh, I can't say I'm happy about that last part, the Delta Scrub part, but the one million subs part, that we like. Well, there's always a, sil a silver lining there. It means we're going to see Delta IV heavy for a little bit longer. It's scrubbed, but, you know, we still are seeing it. Kinda. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least we have the million subs. That That's something cool. That is true. But yeah, I always try to bring all the stats that, that I can. And today it's filled with, with you know, milestones everywhere. It's kind of crazy. But but yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I guess because yep, I, I, just, I just did the math because uh, I'm, I'm still updating all my all my spreadsheets. I update them while I'm, I'm coming to. I shouldn't do that, but I do it still. <laughs> um, so the turnaround time is six days, 18 hours, and 43 minutes. There you go. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep with yeah. the support. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Sideshow Bob saying happy Easter and congrats on 1 million subscribers. Uh, Donald Carruthers, thanks for five years of space goodness. It is our absolute pleasure. And Asley Industries, thank you for becoming a Red Team member. Hopefully we'll get Max back here soon so we can get his take on what the launch was like for this one and uh, the excitement coming up for launch two. So we'll hear from him in just a moment. In the meantime, though, Alex, what's next with kind of this uh, cruising phase here? So what actually is going on with the second stage and with the satellite? Yeah, so right now we are essentially T plus 13 minutes, right? So in about 13 minutes, we're going to get that uh, relight of the second stage. Right now they are in that coast phase right in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, so they have to, they don't have any, any um, views right now from the ground stations. But once they regain that, we're going to see that second stage uh, should be going into uh, engine chill in about five minutes or so. And and then it's all ready for, for that... Um, Relight of the MVAC engine, which again is scheduled for T plus 26 minutes and 45 seconds into the flight, so essentially in a bit under 13 minutes from now. And that'll last for about one minute. It'll push Eutelsat 3060 to that geosynchronous transfer orbit, which is essentially a an oval shaped orbit that is. Uh, pushing the the apogee at or above uh, geostationary altitude. It'll probably be above because Falcon 9 has plenty of performance to do that and what that means is that the the satellite will not need as much propellant to be able to to be put itself onto that geostationary orbit but also as i mentioned before you use this electrical uh, electric uh, thrusters ion thrusters and that takes a lot of time because they are low thrust and so it takes a lot of time if Falcon 9 can push it closer to that to that orbit that means having this satellite in operation much earlier, which is more money in the bank for Eutelsat. So they'll be happy. Happy customer means happy uh, happy everyone, because everyone, SpaceX will be happy to be to have done the mission, and the customer will have paid everything, <laughs> of course. Yeah. They'll get their TV, yes. Exactly. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, here's a question from Marte, I, or Mart. Uh, not sure the exact pronunciation there. Uh, with that second launch coming up uh, in a couple hours from now, uh, they want to know, do they have enough fuel on site to launch two in one day? Um, well, they are they are different launch pads, so they have their own different tank farms, and obviously they do have enough uh, propellant to be able to to support that because this propellant is not, you know, it's not fed from a single location down. Well, 
I, I'm I'm partly lying there. <laughs> I'll get to back to to that back later. Uh, I kind of relate still also for heavy as well. Um, so they have different commodities and different uh, sort of tank farms, and so obviously they they have uh, separate systems. And so obviously they can they can support that in terms of the fuel on site. And what I was trying to to say before is that it is true that the that the propellants on the Falcon Nine are not are, are not supplied from any pipeline or anything. They just truck it in and have on-site uh, storage tanks. The nitrogen that is used on a lot of the the systems, you know, for purging, for conditioning of the of the lines, or conditioning, uh, well, not not conditioning of the lines, but for example, conditioning of the fairing. Uh, that is actually uh, sent by a pipeline here at 39A from early Quid, I believe. And so that, for example, they have that. At Slick 40, I'm not fully sure. I think they also have their own pipeline, but I think it's another uh, company that distributes that. Uh, at the end of the day, the whole distribution system is run by NASA. And with Delta 4 Heavy, what we had is one of those nitrogen pipelines that they have for the, for the pneumatic systems for the pad. Well, it kind of uh, they they had one pump failure there on that on that pipeline, so they couldn't solve it at uh, you know in, in time for 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 that launch. It was a bit of a of a of a pity, but you know these things happen. Similar thing happened with with SLS in one of the wet dress rehearsals, I think it was. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the giant orange rocket in the room. Air liquid. I, I will good. not forget that pronunciation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's quite fun to say. Um, you know what else is uh, fun to say? Is that we have some amazing shots from the field. So let's start with this image from Max. Love. I always love the flag shots. Those. Oh, just beautiful of it lifting off there. The red, white, and blue. Freedom, Murica, all that kind of stuff. You even got some birds in the shot. Another spectacular, <laughs> spectacular launch photo from Max of a mission for a European provider. <laughs> True, it is European. <laughs> Sorry, I had to mention that. But again, just absolutely beautiful there. And that's the first of three launches today in that shot. I believe we also have some video replays too that we can show you of the liftoff itself. Let's start with this one at the base of the rocket. Wow, look at that. Is that our robots? Uh, I believe it was Kevin operating one of our robotic cameras. Yeah, yes. that's our robots, look at that. Good trick, Kevin, good trick. <laughs> that was yep. nice. You could even see the, uh, the rain birds going down there at the beginning. Yeah, it's you know sometimes you don't really need super fancy hardware to be able to do some some interesting shots, but then we have the actual fancy hardware here with this view. <laughs> yeah, we, if we have it, we'll absolutely take it. Of course. And then another one of our tracking shots there. You could see it on the right there. Looks like almost the same camera. In fact, it probably is. You can see also the difference between how you know how the Stromback went back, and then... And then speaking of that Look flag that. shot, that is the flag right in the middle of the screen there that is in that photo that Max took. So you can imagine more or less, now Now we can sort of dox where, where Max was located, because we can see this location and how the rocket is going up, where the flag is located. <laughs> I mean, you can also see people literally running down by the flag there, but yes. Ooh, look at that, yeah. I just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> run, run, run! <laughs> oh, the people running to get the shots. Here's another one of our cameras. Oh, that liftoff part is beautiful. Now we get to see it through the clear blue skies. Absolutely gorgeous. And I promise birds are closer than they appear. This is the track that D took from us out in the field here. Hand track. It's amazing just every time going uphill, it still has that that view of like, how is this thing flying? It's like, it, you know, giant stick 
as you get higher up, it looks like it's kind of just floating there, and yet it's going thousands of kilometers an hour already at this point. And by the way, just worth pointing out that it looks like the TE is already back up. I get ready for the next mission. I believe the next mission is Bandwagon 1. Oh, there's the, the ring. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> that was the ring. That was passing through the speed of sound. You get the vapor cone that comes around it and then leaving that sort of ring behind it. That is... <laughs> oh, love the vapor rings. Wow, and look at the contrail as well. Like You can see there, it was somewhat windy, I guess. It, it probably wasn't a, an issue for today's launch, but still, you can notice that even at altitude, it, it was somewhat windy, because you can see there the squiggliness of that, of that contrail. <laughs> yeah. But still right on target. That's... Vehicle's powerful enough and has enough gimbal and wiggle to it, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, to get it where it needs to go. <laughs> oh, that vapor ring is just too cool. Yeah. Uh, while we're taking a look at this, I believe we have Max available back from the field to chat with us. Max, do we have you? And if so, how was that launch? Uh, I would, I would sure hope you have me. How do you? How do I sound? Uh, I, would, I would sure hope you have. Me. Uh, do you really want me to say? I mean, you sound great. I think we also actually have the microphone by the camera on still, so, so I'm getting a bit of echo. I think if we could get on top of that. Um, but also, you really cannot ask for better launch conditions than this. Whether with the with the with the sun behind you and the late evening light, the, with, with the pad being lit the way it is, and just a crystal clear blue sky and having a clear view all the way through ascent. It was beautiful, and and the sound today was super punchy. Um, I wasn't on the lawn as you as you probably saw from the 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 image. I was uh, closer to the press center to align the launch pad and the the American flag um, for that shot. So I didn't hear so much of the VAB squeal today, unfortunately. But um, good golly, Miss Molly, that was absolutely stunning. We also typically don't really hear the VAB squeal from thirty nine A. It's usually either from forty or the LZs, but yeah. Exactly. So that wasn't you running wildly by the flag then that we caught on one of our cameras. That was not. No, I was trying to not get in <laughs> anyone else's shot. Anyone, anyone else's shot. So I, I was running in the uh, the background, trying to get back to uh, the station here with the and get that uh, image ed edited and posted. So no, that was not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we had you the previous launch where you were swatting away all the mosquitoes and everything. So we've already got you on camera once this month. We're good. And hopefully it won't be that 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 bad again uh, later on tonight. Well, I think with with it flying at nine or closer to to nine o'clock, I think we should be past the prime mosquito hour. Thankfully, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that won't be the case. Yeah, as of now, the current T zero for the next launch from the Cape, which is another Falcon Nine for Starlink six dash forty five, is nine o two p.m. Eastern. That is the opening of the window that they're currently targeting. Yeah, a very short window, which is. Quite rare for Falcon 9 uh, starting missions, but, you know, one hour, they can still launch it. Then you can see, again, the, the vapor. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I think the oh, vapor right cone streaked out the tracking camera there. Yeah. Oh, this is auto track? This looks like the auto track. It's auto yep. track. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well. Yeah, got a little faked out there with the vapor cone, but, again, <laughs> passing through the speed. Of... I just loved when you see that ring there. It's... It's so cool, which uh, it kind of looks like, you know, kids don't smoke. It's bad for you. Don't don't do it. Kind of looks like people that try and do trick things with smoke. So maybe try it only with supervision using liquid nitrogen. But <laughs> these are <laughs> these are great shots here. I got to say again. From the people to the robots, amazing job all around from the team here. As we Meanwhile. I was going to say, as we continue to wait for the reignition of the second stage, right? Yeah, right now, um, the MBAC engine is chilling down ahead of that ignition, that relight of high max in this. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's chilling down, preparing for that relight, which should happen in about one minute from now. 
Hey. Hi, Max hi, and D everybody. on the right there. <laughs> yeah, we're we're still out here, uh, <laughs> and now we we have to get uh, configured for Starlink here in a few hours. So we are luckily in a good spot where we can literally just pivot our cameras toward a different launch pad and uh, be ready to go. So, do you need to rotate the table as well? We don't actually. That's why uh, I have the table angled the way it is. So towards either launch pad, it's, it's useful. So. <laughs> there you go. Thinking, thinking smart there. That's the NSF way. All right. Now we can see there is that second stage engine. As you mentioned, it's been chilling down, getting ready for SES2, second engine start two for one final burn here. And that is expected to last a, about, about minute. a minute. Yes. Yeah. Look out for that for that solid oxygen blob there to fly off into the exhaust as soon as it relights. It's always amazing. There's and the green tea oh, tail. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Just demolished. And it's always amazing to see that. But there you can see a healthy MVAC engine glowing as expected. Um, performing its relight to throw Eutelsat 3060 into that geosynchronous transfer orbit. Um, I gotta say, like it's it's always quite mind blowing to to see these these relights happening. This is, I guess, the three hundred and something MVAC or something. It's I don't even keep track of that because it's already too much. <laughs> it's a lot of MVACs. To be coming up on the shutdown in just a few more seconds. So far, everything looking pretty good. Already, already over 36,000 kilometers an hour. And shut down. There we go. At an altitude of 235 kilometers for right now. Alex, as our resident looking at the trajectory numbers, uh, isn't boy. that good? Well, I'm more uh, I'm more well versed with uh with the Starlink. I can tell you that is about nine thousand kilometers per hour more than what they achieve on Starlink missions. But the Starlink missions are in very low Earth orbits, um, whereas this is going to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. So you can see there that's a satellite. I think that's the moon. Is that the moon behind the satellite? Uh, hmm. that could be. Yeah, well, that, that's the moon. <laughs> but. But yeah, the, the satellite is going to a much more energetic orbit than, than Starlink. That is why uh, they cannot launch as, as much. Ooh, look at that. Ooh. that. That's lightning. Yeah, lightning from the Earth below, as you can yeah. see on the night side of the Earth there. And it's hard to... Yeah, that uh, is the moon, I believe, that just went behind the satellite. Which will be coasting for another five-ish minutes or so before deploying the UTELSAT. 36D satellite into its parking orbit. You can so, see some flakes of ice floating off, and now they're showing a promo. Okay. <laughs> it's snowing. Uh, so how exactly, though, does it get from this geostationary transfer orbit where SpaceX leaves it to its final orbit, the 36 degrees east point? Yeah, the satellite has this set of Ion thrusters is going to take a lot of time to get there again because they are very low thrust. So every every time every orbit it kind of fires the engines a bit. It, it, it I, I'm saying every orbit, but it's actually probably not even every orbit because they are electric thrusters. So they probably need to recharge the batteries and everything, point the the solar panels to the sun and and, and all of that. So once it is deployed, all of these you know solar panels and antennas and everything will get deployed. And while they do that, we'll check out the the thrusters, the attitude control systems, and then those those ion thrusters will be used for a series of of months. Normally, it's about six months. Sometimes it is a bit longer to get there. So this the satellite's not going to enter operations, you know, immediately. It's going to take a while to get there. Probably later this year, um, it'll get to that point. 
but you know where because <laughs> we don't we don't track that on, on a live stream or, or anything that will be bonkers to track on a live stream but i always find very interesting that we have a forum hi people we have a forum and so people in the forum actually post updates of where the satellite is located and so very regularly every few days or every few weeks we see these you know uh data from from the from the US Space Force on what is the new orbit of the satellite and you see little changes happening depending on the propulsion if it's hypergolic propulsion it's a major change if it is electric propulsion like this one has it is a, a much smaller change over time but it gets there and it'll get there in a few months more lightning i love it with this these shots oh. of you know looking at at the at the earth back and the lightning and everything and it's always it amazing just how quickly it gets over to the uh, night side of the Earth as well, considering where it launched from. The sun is still up for another hour and a half or so. Yeah. You can see there how it's going up in altitude and how the, the velocity has already quickly decreased. It has gone down by about 1,000 kilometers per hour. It's, yeah. Which is it's physics. <laughs> Orbital mechanics. Yeah, as you go up, you slow down. Oh, again, just seeing the lightning below that. Uh, jealous of the of the astronauts aboard the ISS. So again, this will continue to coast for just a little bit longer before satellite deploy. So while we have a few minutes here, uh, I just want to thank uh, Michael Tompkins Jr., who asks, "Who is UTELSAT Group?" Which is a uh, communications company. Uh, that provides a lot of TV services via satellite to customers, uh, typically on the European side of the globe, uh, and also some government services as well. And this will go to support that network. And then the more important question from B0 Oz saying, how is UTELSAT Group? I hope they're doing good now that their satellite is uh, <laughs> minutes away from deploy. They always ask, <laughs> right? They always ask, what are you? Not how are you? Yeah, they'll probably be very, very happy in just a few more minutes as, well, it should be deploying in under a minute now. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll be very happy immediately after it deploys. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah. So we're saying it's always good. Them. Oh, look at that purging on the uh, strong back there as well. We saw. Yeah, probably clearing out the lines to be able to to safely approach the the launch pad. There we go. And speaking of Utelsat Group, there's their logo plastered right over the live feed. <laughs> Coming up on on deployment in just a few more seconds. What kind of deployment mechanism does Falcon use again? It kind of depends on the satellite. Sometimes it's uh, pyrotechnic. Sometimes it's just simple pushers um, or like sp springs, things like that. It kind of depends. Let's hope the video signal holds. Come on. There we go. There it is. Signal held just long enough to see it separate away. Absolutely beautiful. All shiny and yellow. <laughs> to the darkness. <laughs> it's yellow. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, wrong color. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there you go. That is the two launches that remain. You have the... Uh, on the right will be the next one. That is coming from Space Launch Complex 40. And the one on the left there was Vandenberg, which was also scheduled to launch later today. So the first successful deploy of the day after the first successful launch. Amazing. A uh, couple more bits of support here. Steve saying, new shirt ideas. Birds are closer than they appear, or rockets are closer than they appear. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and Techno Blaze asking, do Starlink sets have cameras to monitor space around them? Guessing that's what I mean by SL sets. Starlink, probably. Yeah, is what they mean. Well, we know that they have cameras fitting on, uh, on them for engineering purposes, but we don't really know 
if they really use that, what they what they tend to do is that they, you know, the the U.S. Space Force. I think it is the Space Launch Delta 18, the one that tracks all, or, or tries to track all of the objects in space. And so they have this data. It is updated every few hours. It's you know very very concise. And so SpaceX has this sort of summary of all of that data that they dump into the satellites and so the satellites are aware of where other satellites are located uh within the constellation but also you know potential debris that are being tracked other sorts of uh satellites from other people uh, space stations <laughs> but but yeah um that's that's more or less they, they don't really need cameras per se but they do have the cameras they're just for other purposes not for that in particular so there you go. And again, at least we got to see the separation there from that second stage, which is going to burn up and sort of re-enter. Uh, it should be around the coast of uh, South Africa, I believe it is, for this one. So that for, will... Oh, for your Sat 36? No, they don't deorbit the second stage. We probably oh, no, should, should make a video out of this. Ooh. We'll put that in video ideas, but yeah. <laughs> so that one goes into sort of a graveyard orbit then? Yeah, it sticks in the same orbit that it, that it has deployed the, the satellite in. And what it does is that the, the lower part of the orbit is close to the, to the Earth. And so it encounters some of the atmospheric drag every single time it passes through that. And over time, in a matter of... Depending on, on the orbit, obviously, it kind of depends. But depending on that orbit, it's somewhere between months and a couple of years. But yeah. That's that's essentially what what will happen with with this second stage. For Starlink missions, they don't go as far and as high energy of an orbit, so they can actually do that the orbit burn. Uh, but speaking of having more launches later today, I wonder what Max and D will do today. We're seeing them here on our view. Max, um, <laughs> what you gonna be you, doing today? Yeah, are you two gonna stay there or like go out and then come back? What's, what's your you plan? know this is a lot of gear to leave on its own um i may make a quick uh food run for both of us and then come back but the plan is really just to keep everything here and and literally just pivot our cameras toward pad 40 so <laughs> keep it as efficient as possible <laughs> I mean, that works that's a smart plan uh keeping in mind that that next launch again the window opens at 902 p.m. eastern which means Make sure that you've got your notifications and everything ready here. When we go live, approximately one hour before liftoff, so around 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is just an hour and a half from now. So more rockets, more better. And yeah. I, I think that's probably a good point to say thank you to Max Evans out in the field for rolling out there. Thank you, Max. Always happy to do it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. And we got one more left to go, at least here from Florida. So stay tuned. Yes. And we see D right next to you. Thank you, D, as well, for rolling out, too. Always appreciate it. There's the thumbs up. Nice. <laughs> uh, I would say keep, in my, keep an eye out on shop.nasaspaceflight.com because there may be a photo that was taken that could potentially end up in the shop as a metal print intent. And then, uh, <laughs> speaking of ooh, Alex, thank you <laughs> for joining us for this one. Uh, thanks for having me. And, you know, SpaceX is having a treble header today. We're also having a treble header. If you haven't watched the NSF Live that we had today with Dr. Phil Metzger, you should watch it. It was super amazing. And, you know, this today, this was the uh, second live stream today, but we have another third one. So it's going to be also a triple header for NSF. But, you know, we're, we're already doing triple headers all the time, right? Because we also have three live streams going 24-7. That is Space Coast Live, Starbase Live, and McGregor Live. So obviously it is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of piece of cake, it is not a piece of cake to keep this stream up and running and going. So we had Jay in the back there, who was in the human-sized hamster wheel today, pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, sending all of these photons to you. So a big thank you to Jay. Also with some support from Mr. Kevin Michael Reed, uh, whose voice you may have heard on NSF Live last night. 
never really shows up with his voice on these streams, but I still love him anyway. And the amazing team that we have. So thank you, most importantly, for watching. And uh, we will hopefully see you again in about 90 minutes from now for launch number two. I have been Sawyer Rosenstein, your host for this particular launch. And we will see you very shortly. Later, nerds. And here we go. The chamber pressure looks good. Following up.